Hey, welcome back. Hi, Aidem. How are you doing? Very good, actually. So, uh, lots of interesting projects and, uh, yeah, too much to do and too little time, but this is a good problem to have. So, uh, what's about you? Yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy. This, uh, this period, um, you know, the usual stuff we do plus all this AI craze. And, uh, you know, it's wild west right now, but it's super yeah. interesting. But, uh, Dimitris, your, um, your role, you are product manager of Corcus, right? I'm actually engineering director of mm-hmm. the, of the team. So I'm on the R and D side of things. R and D. So, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm running like the, the overall, overall responsibility for the Quarkus team and all my old folks from uh, Wildfly and the AP. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, what's your power? So, what what you can influence? So, let's say if you could, can you decide what's the next extension in Quarkus, or this is more about the role of product manager, or you can just you know research things. So, uh, we ha- we have a product manager, mm-hmm. it's Thomas Quanstrom. Mm-hmm. Um, in Red Hat, an engineering manager is like a jack of all trades. So it's a bit of. Uh, Dealing with people, dealing with uh, strategy, dealing with, uh, you know, some people are very technical, others less. Mm -hmm. Some people might go and, you know, do advocation, speak to customers. So it's, it's a bit of everything really. Uh, and it, it's good in the, in the sense that you can shape your role as you want it, more or less. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what are you doing current, currently? So, if it's not top secret, so Quarkus wise. So um, what's yeah, no, it's not uh, top secret. Uh, lately, I've put some effort around uh, this AI thing mm-hmm. um, because uh, we've tried to figure this out for some t- some time, like more than a year or before that, and. I'll tell you this story because, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, Red, Red Hat has a big, let's say, AI interest mm-hmm. around something called OpenShift AI, mm-hmm. and this is really how you can do, uh, let's say, manage models like L- model ops. So you want mm-hmm. to train models, deploy them, monitor, run them on clusters, you know, open source clusters in the cloud and on your on-premise, uh, even on the edge sometimes. So there's a lot of stuff that has to do with, let's say, the server side of, of those things. But there's also the developer side, right? How, how, okay, if you have the infrastructure, how you use it? Mm-hmm. And the thing is, for the past, let's say, many years or two, three years, this area is dominated by Python, Python mm-hmm. tooling, Python everywhere. But the truth is business applications are written in Java predominantly. Mm-hmm. And they're not going to retool to Python to do those, those things. So how mm-hmm. are we going to do them? And there hasn't been a good answer for some time. And, and I, I, at, the, at the end of the day, you might say that, okay, chat GPT, it's an API, right? Why well, I just call this API and I do things. Uh, but it's not that simple because it's a special API. So why it's special? Because it's not deterministic. Every time you call it, you get something different. Yeah. <laughs> and it's completely stateless. Mm-hmm. Every time you call, it's a new discussion. So if you want to emulate something that, that looks like a discussion, it, you do it on the client side. You need some special thing there to, to keep state, um, you know, replay this state, uh, you know, parse things, or even, you know, talk to different models that have different API and might be remote, might be local. So there's actually a lot. And, and while we've been searching into this for some time, we didn't really make the, some breakthrough. And this all changed in October, last October, where I went to, um, DevOx, uh, Belgium. And this project was presented essentially for the first time, Langchain for j mm-hmm. which wasn't, it's like 
pretty new. It started like in May or June last year. Mm-hmm. And it's a clean room, clean room implementation of the long chain concepts that come from Python. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I saw this, this talk and, you know, I was very much impressed. It was like, oh, you know, that's how you do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and in the conference, I had some colleagues of mine. So, I, you know, I, I found the, the speaker, this lady, Lisa Race, and then she introduced. She wears Quarkus, how do you know, right? Uh, yeah, we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> and she introduced me to the author of the library. So mm-hmm. Dimitro, like he was there. He was at the conference. Mm-hmm. And of course, we sat down and we talked like, I don't know, for an hour. Because I could see the potential. It's this library, but. I could imagine that, you know, when you do this in Quarkus, we can make it special. We can make it like a very nice integration. And I talked to the guy. Then I had the colleague, Georgios. Mm-hmm. Andrianakis was there in the corridor. So I ran to Georgios and I said, George, he was there with his laptop. And I told him, drop everything you do and start writing an extension now mm-hmm. for LangChain. <laughs> And Georges is a hacker, so, you know, he just started coding, you know, coding, mm-hmm. coding, coding. And three hours later, he had, like, a prototype. And and Max was at the conference, you know, the, the Quarkus co lead, and, uh, and he saw that, and he was impressed. <laughs> and he arranged next day that we meet with, again, with the Langchain folks and make a mm-hmm. demo. Mm-hmm. So we made a demo, we showed how it looked like, and they were impressed. And then we agreed, okay, that's super interesting. We go back and we work on it to make like a proper integration. And that's what we did. And six weeks later, we had like, you know, a version one of Langchain 4J in Quarkus. We announced it to the world in November. Mm-hmm. And since then, since then, it's, it's crazy. Like mm-hmm. it's, and it's crazy. Why? Because it makes it so easy to start playing with this stuff. Mm-hmm. So the main use case is like, I don't know, a few lines of code. Mm-hmm. But then it gets more complicated when you have to do this, you know, this uh, rug thing, retrieval of the generation. But I think we can find ways to simplify that as well. Um, and this, you know, it's, it opens up the door to people to do really, really interesting stuff. I think we'll be amazed by what people will come up with as soon as you give them the, the possibility. And I, and to me, it looks like Langchain 4J has a very good chance to become like the standard in Java for this type of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, we I see now contributions from other companies like Google and Microsoft. Uh, it, it, it looks like, you know, they have the hibernate of LLMs because it abstracts what you talk to mm-hmm. through a nice API, it can deal with all different, uh, you know, models and APIs, and then it can deal with a, a lot of, uh, you know, vector stores. We can talk about this, which is one of the things you need if you want to do some advanced stuff in a very nice way. And um, so, yeah, I think we can, as a community, we can collaborate there mm-hmm. and make it better and open up the door to whatever 15 million, 70 million Java developers to really, you know, fight back and reclaim mm-hmm. the throne from the Python folks. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. I uh, one question regarding uh, OpenShift uh, AI. So this is like you, you can you can train your own models on, on OpenShift, right? So this is the mm-hmm. deal. Yeah. And uh, but you will have also have to call them, right? So this is the same problem. I always want because I always ask myself first. So the models are usually stateless. Oh, are always stateless. Yeah, <laughs> except you know uh, the the ChatGPTs, but because yeah. over so, time, sorry, sorry, ChatGPT, they have a middleware in between to make it look like there is state. No, I know when you but, talk to uh, what, the to the when you talk to the OpenAI thing, there is no state. Yeah, but uh, the interesting part uh, in the uh, this is what I didn't understood um, about uh, GPT because um, they rescrape the internet in a period so you will always find you know old stuff there mm-hmm. but apparently the interaction the users with the model changes the state of the model 
because there was some research and over time the GPT became worse. So mm -hmm. like, you know, the communication with the GPT influences the state somehow. So, okay, th this is interesting first, but um, the normal models are stateless. So, but are they concurrent? Interesting question, right? With how many threads you can call your model, for instance, is also interesting. So how to deal this? And uh, for me, it's also it was always the question, I get more and more requests, how to integrate such an AI with an existing enterprise application. Mm -hmm. And in Java, this is HTTP, I mean REST. So what I did is use HTTP 11 client or micro profile REST client. Mm -hmm. The problem is, of course, if something comes back, you have to parse it. Right, so this is also a challenge. So you have to tell the, you have to tell the model, "Hey, I would like to have Jason," and really Jason, and then you know you have to parse where yeah. the Jason starts, where it stops, and and you know extract the Jason. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, on the other side uh, is if you do the rag, we can talk uh, also about you. You need um, the embeddings, and sure. this is a little bit more painful because you have to scan the text, you know, uh, in in the parts which are overlapping or not, and mm -hmm. this is more challenging. But at the end, what we actually need is a stateful uh, HTTP core. So we have a HTTP client which calls to the model, remembers what it did, and resends all the data back, right? So this is the first, so like a state machine, mm -hmm. not state, st session, conversational scope. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> we need a CDI conversational scope on Lang chain, and the on the conversational part is your is, is your prompt right so as long as you communicate with the prompt is the conversation and um and uh rack is interesting because we need um an embedded um uh, not embedded vector database and the there are only a few vector databases in java this is interesting so i was i was stunned most of them are in c and rust and there are not that many in java right but look so a couple of things um yes I agree with what you say, and but and that's exactly the reason to use Langchain for J because it will do most of the things for you. you don't have you don't have to. Mm -hmm. Now, in the Quarkus context, when you use this thing, we chose to to model this that, so that it looks like uh, REST client. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just so you just define interface, and you say this I annotated with um, you know AI service. Mm -hmm. register a service meaning i want quarkus to use internally langchain to wire this with whatever model i have configured mm -hmm. so any method you put there you annotate it you put a prompt in the annotation and it will you know it will send it to the other side send you back the result mm -hmm. it's very very clean now the default is for this to be stateless mm -hmm. every web request of reaches Quarkus, it will be in a conversation. If within the same request you have like two calls, it will chain them together mm -hmm. to emulate this, you know, state thing. So it will do this for you. If you somehow, let's say, annotate this bin with uh, application scope, it will survive between, mm -hmm. you know, it will be like the same conversation. So, so you have ways to play with this with annotations. Or you can choose to provide like a, there's an annotation called a memory ID mm -hmm. that you define exactly what's the, to which discussion you want to um, tie this uh, you know call. So you mm -hmm. can have multiple calls like you know with different context, and it will remember that. And the default is to have some sort of in memory memory. Cyclical one with how, how many items, like default is 10, but you can make it bigger. Uh, or you can offload this to a database and say, you know, I keep my state to wherever. So, yeah, so there's nice ways to deal with this. Now, about... Uh, about maybe I was, maybe yeah. I was too fast. No. So, um, way too fast. So, because what I explained at once is what you can do with Java Plane and what the problem is because you will have to remember what you did and resend it back. But if we start to explain Langchain, right? Mm -hmm. So we would, I, most popular is ChatGPT. So what you will need, you need your uh, like, uh, um, API keys. That's it. Yeah. For 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 ChatGPT, there mm -hmm. have to be application properties or in environment entries, I assume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then and then you can inject um, a prompt. What is the the type of the interface? In 
Oh, okay, so again, so uh, you want to talk to that GPT. In Quarkus, you will choose the OpenAI extension, uh-huh. nothing else. Uh-huh. You, you do that, you put your key in your properties file, uh-huh. and then you just define an interface, uh-huh. and you annotate it with register AI service, and this uh-huh. will tell Quarkus to use the active model, so in this case, ChatGPT, to... For every method you put there, you put like, you, you can put like two annotations. One is the user prompt, which is like what I will send to the model. You have, you have also a system and system mm-hmm. uh, prompt, which mm-hmm. defines the role. Like, uh, you are a, yeah, exactly. a, so like a assistant, book, a book assistant, assistant you mm-hmm. answer in the same language, uh, mm-hmm. you are polite mm-hmm. and you try to follow those rules. Huh? And you can have like you know one page of, of of stuff, and to make this even more configurable, this annotation is essentially a template, and you can have, play you know things replaced with the arguments to the call. So I have like a name here, so replace it with the string name, whatever it is that you have in there. Mm-hmm. And then you can you you can say at inject, yeah yeah with uh, a qualifier yeah, on, uh, on at inject my bin. That's it, and I use it exactly. And uh, so this is the Quarkus way to interact with ChatGPT, mm-hmm. and uh, the interface gets proper implemented. The mm-hmm. uh, assistant or system annotation parsed, and the text sent to okay. the backend. Exactly. Come back and parsed. So mm-hmm. I assume what you also have some support JSON serialization, right? So if I would like, yes, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. So um, what it means exactly what is said? This this link chain or Quarkus is more or less like JPA of persistence, right? So because you you just use entity manager and you don't care that there's hibernate behind or um, mm-hmm. or or, um, or uh, Eclipse Link or uh, or the other providers, for instance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Open JPA. So this is like a, a facet that makes everything nicer. And uh, so the next step would be to remember what you did, right? So you would like to have uh, you would like to ask, then get you know the answer back, and then don't forget the context, the memory, and do something with it. So there is support as well. So again, if within the same uh, scope. request scope, mm-hmm. you have multiple calls to the model, mm-hmm. those will be chained together. Yeah. So it means this well, is solved beautifully with yes. scope. Yes. So we use yes. scope. And yeah. if you have in the scope, this is completely transparent for yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. If I put request scoped or I will call it twice so it forgets what it did, this is actually very natural to Quarkus developers because this is how scopes are working. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. So it's, yeah. Um, and there, are, if you go now into the configuration properties like through the dev UI and, mm-hmm. and look for lang chain for j there you will find everything related to this stuff. So you will see like I'm using an in memory memory that holds 10 items. Or or whatever whatever tokens, and I can make it bigger, smaller, mm-hmm. or I can replace this with you know my own memory that I control. And if I do that, then on the methods uh, of on, of my interface, I need to pass a something with a at memory ID mm-hmm. annotation, mm-hmm. and I need to provide the implementation for that. And then Quarkus will call it, so I have control over, you know, what, how exactly I do, like I handle my memory, if I wanted to persist it to a database or, yeah. So and in this case, I need to pass like a key to define like which context this discussion will belong to. So you have, uh, you can have a longer conversation than yes. your. Uh, yeah, this would yeah. be important if you work in serverless environment or whatever, because then, you know, the memory just disappears after the call, so you can persist it somewhere and restore it then. From... Exactly. But you have to remember always that you are constrained by the size of the context of the model, Yeah. which is whatever, 32 Which is model dependent, right? Yeah, so yes. Token. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. So... And I think there's support as well, so you can say max tokens, and then you get exception, whatever, right? So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, and um, and then when you said about uh, the, the vector stores, yeah, this is also handled very nicely because um, 
if you go to code Quarkus IO and filter for LangChain, mm-hmm. you'll get normally two things. You get either different models, mm-hmm. not models really, APIs. So you have mm-hmm. OpenAI, Azure OpenAI, um, Local, Olama, Hugging mm-hmm. Face. And with those APIs, you can choose different models, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have like five, six different vector stores. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you say, you know, let's say I use Redis. Mm-hmm. Um, so you include those two extensions. And then when you start Quarkus in mm-hmm. dev mode, you know, Quarkus will spin up a container in the background with Redis and it will wire it together. So it's already there for you. Whether it's written in Java or not, we don't care. It's another service running a container. Um, and that will work also, you know, out of the box if you want to do those more advanced uh, use cases with a uh, rug. Mm-hmm. No, um, I just stated just as a curiosity that mm-hmm. uh, there are not that many uh, stores within Java. If they were, well, uh, even better because you can natively in- integrate them in LangChain without yeah. Docker, for instance, yeah. right? Yeah. But there is one, it's called JVector, for instance. Mm-hmm. This is from the Cassandra guys. There is one, this native Java, and another is also on the horizon, so that, that this is coming, because it will be something like H2 or DerbyDB, right? Where you can directly use it or even embed it, which is always nicer than a Docker. And this is coming, and the JVector is very fast. So yeah. it is a crazy fast one. Okay. Mm-hmm. Another interesting thing there is, you know Infinispan? Yeah. Well, Infinispan, wouldn't be hard to repurpose it as a vector store. And I think they're looking into this. This would be perfect, right? So we have another yeah. one. Uh, yeah. And yeah. with clustering and everything, right? Yeah. And uh, it is uh, battle-proofed. I mean, it finished yeah, yeah. forever. Yeah, it yeah. was used already for yeah. white flag clustering, for uh, for messaging uh, ActiveMQ. No, what was it? In? Not active, ActiveMQ, right? What was you know the white flag messaging solution? Is active. Yeah, uh, Artemis. Uh, Artemis, exactly. Yes. Not active. Artemis. Yeah. Oh, ah, in exactly. Finispan was used there as a distributed cache. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, as you said, it's battle tested. So it's just like another, you know, API or whatnot on top of. Hibernate Infinite. search use Infinispan. Hibernate use Infinispan. Yeah, so yeah, everyone. Yeah. 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 yeah what we're we saying now. Um, we said that in Docker container Redis is, is, yeah. is opened in dev mode. Yeah, yeah. So. And uh, about dev mode. Now, the other interesting thing in Quarkus, which I don't think you get with other stuff, is uh, as soon as you have like the model uh, configured through the extension, in, in the dev UI, you immediately have the ability to test prompts. We have a kit you know, like a interface where you go there and you try prompts. <laughs> yeah. You get back replies and you can even try image generation right mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I Liz, think... Liz presented this uh, in CERN. Actually. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. yeah, she was already excited. So, uh, it's a really, uh, really interesting, interesting um, um, option, I would say. Yeah, and and... You know, with Quarkus, I mean, what's special with Quarkus is because of this build time step, we have a very intimate knowledge of the application of what the user tries to do. Mm-hmm. So in my mind, I bring scenarios where, all right, how we use this intimate knowledge now combined with AI? What what can we do? What more can we do? It's not like only for you to write an intelligent application. I can imagine that we can make Quarkus more intelligent you know, as soon as models become smaller and faster, blah, blah, blah. Maybe. What can you do locally? Like how this dev UI could help you, you know, write code, debug code, or, you know, I mean, I don't know. Some ideas will come up, I'm sure. So we get the quark as an, your digital assistant, right? So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, But what I also uh, was already discussing as an architecture you, you, of course, are aware with the Drools project, right? So, like, um, mm-hmm. and um, and um, it is it's unrelated to LangChain, but um, there, there was a project where they have all the context data, but the decision was somehow hard. Mm-hmm. And they said, okay, we could actually try AI in this particular case to at least suggest a solution and see whether it works, and then you'll decide further. And uh, this could be other thing, right? Because uh, what you only need is you need... Uh, 
a simple interface. Uh, here is the data, and and you get to know uh, in and back what's the decision or record with this more complex. And 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 within this implementation, we can access Quarkus Lang Chain extension to perform the decision, and we could even pull data from outside, right? So we could even because we have complete integration with JPA and and all these stores it doesn't have to be JPA, JSON, whatever. So we can go to our data store, say, look, this is our knowledge right now. Here's the knowledge. Here are the parameters. Please decide, right? Mm-hmm. And with LangChain, we could even ask different models, you know, three models, yes, and, yes. And, and and pick the majority, and then say, okay, two models, you know, were for it. <laughs> but this is, sounds complex, but in this ecosystem, it's relatively simple to implement, actually. Yeah. And uh, I'm curious to know what is the impact of uh, of the AI LLMs on on rule engines, because uh, you, I mean, I mean, this is not deterministic. Right, this mm-hmm. is a little bit of a problem with AI, but as a suggestion, it's a good enough. You know, it, 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 you cannot maybe do uh, self driving <laughs> with it, <laughs> but uh, but at least suggest you you should you know turn to, uh, slow down, for instance. This yeah. you could do, right? Yeah. Like a suggestion for the driver, please slow down because something happens, and this a suggestion is absolutely okay. I would say. Yeah, I think there are like two schools of thought here. The challenge with those LLMs is. As you said, they're not deterministic. So the whole trick is how to, let's say, constrain them exactly. to do the usual, the useful stuff with the less, let's say, variation, the less probability mm-hmm. for error. Uh, some people said, oh, yeah, like uh, those things will now become the center of your app and blah, 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 you know. But I think that's quite dangerous. Um, and I saw another pattern that I found very interesting where they had something like some sort of state machine. Mm -hmm. Uh, So let's say I'm in the phase, let's say you are in a whatever customer booking scenario Mm -hmm. and there are different phases like uh, get the data of the customer, find out uh, the limitations of the booking, make a change. So you can imagine that those could be different steps in a state machine and then you invoke the LLM for that particular step, you yeah. try to constrain it to, you know, as much as possible so it don't, doesn't screw up. Um, and I found this very interesting and somehow this could fit better workflow, mas- or, you know, workflow systems or maybe rule-based systems. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see, you know, how we fit this stuff uh, in those cases and, yeah. In another project, it is highly critical one. It is um, it is a critical infrastructure, but there's lots of data people have to monitor, right? So mm-hmm. I say uh, we could absolutely include AI because the AI, if AI detects a problem, let's say, mm-hmm. then can suggest, suggest something. I think there is a problem and the reason why, you know. And if the operator sees that, you say okay, makes it sense or doesn't make it sense. So in this particular case, it's perfect because. Uh, but you shouldn't do this like the AI says everything is fine and go to vacations and everything blows up. This will be the wrong approach, right? But as an additional hint, this is always a good thing. All pre-feeling stuff, you know, if there is something like I would like to start a new project, create something, this is okay. And uh, I use, you know, um, um, Copilot and different tools, what they are generating, still useful, but 60% or 50% are throw away. But mm-hmm. sometimes I get interesting ideas. So the value is is absolutely there. But you you must not rely on it all the yeah. time. So this is the mm-hmm. wrong approach. But this is nothing else like with humans, right? If you are in project, and and you are discussing things, uh, it's not like I say to everything yes, say something yes, something no, and then we agree on something. And this is what how I see. This is just you know another non deterministic human which provides value or not. But uh, <laughs> but 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 you are more productive at the end of the day because you know the boring stuff helps you with it and. And this is, I think, this is all user interface. Yeah. Complete different, uh, complete different uh, idea or idea a project I was. It was actually airport control tower, and uh, there the problem everything was asynchronous. So now that if you have everything asynchronous and the operator in the control tower pushes a button, you know, mm-hmm. um, how to in one transaction you know go to application to the application server, update the database, come back and it knows that something happens. What what if the database is too slow, or we get timeout, or uh, so there's actually no way to do it. And 
what what, uh, what we did is we said, okay, if someone sends you know the the message to the database, the UI changes the color from dark to I forgot what it was brown or whatever, mm-hmm. and it comes back is green. And if it's red, we knew something went wrong, but the operator was in charge yeah, to decide feedback, what to do. Yeah. He, so we didn't try to hide the fact that we have transactions. We say something can go wrong, and you know the, the error was part of the use case. And the same for AI. We say, okay, we have here a non-deterministic helper, which help us. He will suggest stuff, but we cannot rely on it. So you know what we do in the UI. And this is the only problem. We cannot include it as a, no, a transaction to, to, a, to a database because it is non-deterministic. But I remember Drool's debugging was also not different. We had you know, to put everything to a memory and hope that at the end of the day, something comes out, right? And, I mean, this was <laughs> <laughs> this was also, um, it was deterministic, but harder to debug, but we have to deal with it. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you're right. I think the feedback is, uh, good feedback is key. Um I think we need to make it evident also like the, the points where NAI is involved. This has to be flagged somehow that mm-hmm. people are aware of what's mm-hmm. going on. Um, yeah, so, you know, interesting use cases will come up, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. And, and it's funny, but, you know, like, I don't know, you didn't see my talk, but I was saying that, you know, AI... You didn't saw my talk. This was the problem. We were at the same time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I was saying that for whatever, 30 years or so, AI never really delivered, right? Mm-hmm. But now it does. Now now it's different. So uh, I remember when I started with computers in my time, there were some people were calling computers electronic brains. Mm-hmm. They had this idea that this is has intelligence. Yeah. And of course, you know, you start it there and you figure out, okay, there's no magic here. This is dumb. It's it's not smart at all. So we but but now it's getting to the point where it's, it is smart and we have to tame this new power. So so I find it super interesting. And okay, another interesting story was uh, when a guy saw this talk, he told me, Look, I studied AI back in the day, and then I had to remove it from my CV because people were laughing at me. <laughs> yeah, this was exactly like JavaScript or Visual Basic. So I said, I did Java, JavaScript at the beginning, but I never told at conferences that I can understand JavaScript because the, you would never get a job back then, you know. Yes. Everyone wanted to have Java. It's like a, JavaScript, no, no, I, I have no idea what it is, right? So I recently, I, I actually... <laughs> you you re-added it now? Yeah, yeah, I outed uh, my... Uh, t- 10 years ago, maybe. So, okay, I actually understand JavaScript can do something, but uh, yeah, <laughs> this was uh, very interesting. <laughs> cool. So, I have a book from 1997. Uh, the title is something like AI with Java. And it's a great book. Uh, actually, the author had the entire source code on, on the CD. And uh, it was neural networks and right. uh, and text recognition, character recognition, actually working one. So uh, back then, and um, I also had um, uh, learned about uh, neural networks back then. I was I liked I liked the idea how they how they're trained with the flows, the matrices, you know, remember the stuff. But there was basically no projects since mm-hmm. then. Twenty twenty four years, right? Um, exactly. So another interesting part, which um, you know, deep nets, not much. Yeah. DeepNets is uh, a project by uh, by uh, Mr. Zoran. I forgot his name, but this is Pure Java AI. Mm-hmm. He's a Java champion, and this is Pure Java, so he can train model in Java. Maybe we get you know some uh, models in. Um, give in a chat. Zoran is his first name, and uh, I forgot his last name. Rings a bell, yeah. Yeah, and. Uh, because if we get something like this, the integration can be even even tighter. It means we could skip, you know, the uh, the REST interface altogether and load it as a Java method, for instance, which makes it interesting. And uh-huh. uh, another thing, I don't know what they are aware of it, uh, 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 a GraalVM developer was able to load the Olama model in Java, pure Java. 
So he wrote a Java 21 wrapper without REST, without anything, and he, he loaded the Olama to Java with Vector API and was able to execute this. So he combined like two languages into one or what? Uh, he lo- the, the, the model is like, it's just like a repository of numbers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he, vr- he loaded this with Java Vector API in Java 21. And you can call now Java interfaces without GNI to, to, to interact with Olama, for instance. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. This is interesting. What what I'm going with it, you know, for smaller models and Quarkus, Mm -hmm. we could even load, you know, the models directly without remoting. Yeah, if you have enough memory, basically, because that's the limiting factor, right? Yeah, but this is, this already, you can use some models, you know, on your machines without any problems. So Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, what, what, what I'm saying is we get speed increase. Yeah, a tremendous speed increase is like by one hundred percent with with this approach, and um, and uh, later, I mean, we only need enough models, and then Quarkus could do. I mean, there's not a problem to load a Java class to Quarkus. I mean, this is what we we could handle, right? <laughs> and um, and uh, this is also an interesting trajectory uh, for that. And uh, there are already you no, know, and also I don't, you, you have to you know this very new, very fresh, but project Babylon. Also tr- tries this is like um, open JDK project. Mm-hmm. Is try you know to run Java more GPUs and you yeah. also know Tornado VM maybe also interesting. This is already available, so they can. This is uh, they are already looking at the integration. But actually, the same story what you told right now is they uh, start uh, to create a startup to to think how to integrate uh, enterprise Java with uh, with AI with LLVMs and this right. is. Yeah, yeah, with Quarkus, of course. <laughs> but uh, I mean, Quarkus on Tornado, you know, with uh, with this, I mean, this is uh, if we get even more, you know, tight integration, could open even more doors because, like, uh, r- right now, this link chain is more like ESB, right? Enterprise Service Bus. It routes between HTTP calls, remember stuff, transforms. This is very efficient ESB, actually, from the technology, right? Enterprise Service Bus link chain internally. Because one model remembers the stuff, because the other remembers the stuff, can persist stuff. It's a router, message router. So this is... Or hibernate. You could think like hibernate, maybe. Yeah. Hibernate from conceptual perspective, because mm. it decouples from database, whatever. What mm-hmm. happens inside, I can call mul- multiple models. I get the results. The results are cached, remembered, at state. I can transform the... In- at, at the output to JSON, so I would say integration broker or something like this between models with hybrid with persistence, right? And then we could even run in length chain inside Java models or tightly integrate Java models without calling out. So this could this is the next step forward because the models I think get smaller and smaller, and you, we get you know we could get for instance a model which is tra- highly trained in in rule decision what you talk mm-hmm. about you don't have you know to to ask ChatGPT and 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 with the prompt we have a very specific model which does that and i think this will be the next the next stage that will be interesting yeah to see it on benchmark and see how feasible this is and uh, there's a, i think there's even scenarios with you know ads ads deployments where you have like uh, closer to the like limits of the network something Mm-hmm. That needs to do some kind of inference, mm-hmm. you know, like I don't know, this is something close to a drone. You know, a drone mm-hmm. is flying and it has to do something smart. Um, but there are already models which are executed in the browser, for instance. There's also another spec. So I would say mm-hmm. we get there, but um, with Quarkus is like a nice platform, you know, to 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 get the integration point, because uh, you, we don't have to bother, you know, with. with the entire boring infrastructure is already done with Quarkus and Langchain, and we can focus on the on the interesting parts. Yeah, it right? makes it super. That's what I'm saying to people. Like you know, uh, you can start playing with it really easily. So if we manage to do like the usual thing, like eight percent of the problems, like super easy, and then the rest of twenty doable, you know, so you have access to the right APIs, then that will be success. So for yeah. Me. Yeah. Yeah. So, w- what are you done with LangChain or are you no, with no, it? no? It's just starting basically. Okay, but, well, what are not the next ideas for Quarkus, which you can <laughs> reveal here, or, or at least reveal? Well, obviously, more models, more stores, and then better rug, mm-hmm. easier, easier. So, uh, yeah, we work very closely. A- explain rug for the listeners. So, all right. Go so, ahead. so rug is, let's say, you have a model trained on whatever data. 
So it knows about this data only, obviously. And then in the discussion, you ask things that the model doesn't know about. So the model can either tell you, I don't know, or it can start making things up, (laughs) which is even worse. (laughs) So if you want to include additional information, let's say you have the company's contracts somewhere. Mm -hmm. One way to do it is you can retrain the model on that data, which is a process which is, let's say, not that easy, mm-hmm. maybe expensive. You know, Very expensive. You, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and you do this. This is the fine tuning. If mm-hmm. you fine tune your model with additional info, so it mm-hmm. learns the extra stuff. The other way to do it is you include the data into the discussion as you discuss with it. Mm-hmm. The question there becomes, all right, let's say I have like some gigabytes of contracts mm-hmm. and my context is only 64K, you know, how, how do I do this? So the way, that, you know, the technique works is you vectorize your data, mm-hmm. vectorize being I'm using some sort of smaller um, embeddings model, that's what it's called, because this vectorization is called like embedding. You make mm-hmm. an embedding. So basically you take the data, you make a vector out of it and you store it in the vector store. And then when you make your discussion, you take your prompt, whatever is your question, you vectorize the prompt as well. Mm-hmm. So using this vector, you can do a proximity search in the vector store Mm -hmm. to find similar things, like semantically similar things. Mm -hmm. So if you ask for, uh, you know, I don't know, let's say, if I have movies in my vector store and I ask, you know, give me, propose me a good horror movie. So it would pick up the word horror probably and look in the database and say, oh, you know, those, you know, 100 movies are probably horror movies. So I include them in the discussion without you knowing. Mm-hmm. So this this data will reach the model and it will combine this knowledge and say, oh. Then soap will come out. Then. <laughs> <laughs> as, as soap, yes. Yeah. Uh, a movie about a developer trying to write a soap application. Yeah, whatever. exactly. Uh, and it will, yeah, it will use it to provide you with an answer that's more up-to-date. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's, that's what it is, really. Um, but dealing with those vectors. Ah, the, so the, the trick there is, okay, now w- when I put the stuff in the database, what exactly do I put? So there are different techniques there to split your data into smaller chunks. And every chunk have like enough metadata to identify this chunk. And maybe mm-hmm. every chunk with the next one somehow overlap. So there is some continuation, um, you know. Yeah. So so this is, I'd say, the most complicated part of the things you do with LLMs. And currently it's a bit, you have, like, for a simple example, you have to write, I don't know, two, three pages of code yeah. to do this. Mm-hmm. So I can imagine that we can make this a lot easier because in most cases, the type of data we have is kind of similar or known. Mm-hmm. So let's say you have emails, right? You know, there's a subject, and there's a body, and or you have some sort of document with a certain type of... I think email would be even easy because we could create one embedding for the entire email, right? So the problem is if this is because, you know, you have one email and mm-hmm. this is the email. Maybe email with the thread would be problem more problematic. Yeah, but if the it's problem like is, big one, yes. The well, problem exactly. is, you know, problem is like if you have... Uh, Long text books yes. or, or, or 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 databases, right? What what would you do then? I mean, this is a, yeah. But um, yeah. So interesting is so um. Just to repeat, is it, it means that we have a, a, the vector store uh, can just compare vectors, mm-hmm. which are I don't know multi-dimensional, thousands of dimensions, um, and uh, and and can tell us how how similar they are. And, and usually with Elasticsearch, something else happened. Uh, we search for a word and mm-hmm. it just search you know, for the word, not for the meaning of the word. Okay. But with the vectors, it searches for the semantics. Yep. So, and what, what you said is uh, what you do, uh, we have a prompt. 
and we create the embeddings from for, for the prompt. It means we know a number in a multi-dimensional space, and then we get to you know another number from our database, and the database will tell us are they similar or not. And the crazy part, we could even submit an image, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the image can be also, the image is also parsed, and uh, we can uh, compute the embeddings for the image. So we can submit an image and get the answer from, from the store. Yeah. And, what, and, then, and then you have to map back to the original data, right? Yeah. Yeah. And this is the, the point. Now, why it help us? Because now it's enterprise ready. Because what happens now is if the vector store tell us, okay, this is the answer, the answer comes from your database and your know, database are hopefully no hallucination. Mm -hmm. that, this yeah. is the, that you are actually, uh, you, are mi you are misusing the AI for comparison and you get the answer from your own database. This yeah. is more or less the, or at least a reference, you know, to your database with some, the uh, ChatGPT will say, have a nice day and how are you? This is, everything is fine. And then there's a link to the, you know, to the absolute truth from your database, product data, license information, whatever you have. And this is the REC pattern. Yeah. And what's painful is the analysis because you have to parse the text, decide how much you parse, send to the database, get the embeddings back. You have to decide, you know, for long text, how much it overlaps, doesn't make sense or, or not. And this is like black art, right? Mm -hmm. Black magic. Yeah. You said the word which trigger. I forgot to tell you the most important thing, right? <laughs> okay. Why Langchain is great in Quarkus? Mm -hmm. So I told you, okay, we have a better way to like present it with RCDI beans, mm -hmm. right? We have the dev UI. It also matches this Quarkus developer mode when you, you try your prompts and you fine tune them and it's very repetitive. So Quarkus will you know, respin at the background for you. Mm -hmm. very easily and then uh, we we introduce SPIs into Langchain so we can replace libraries in Langchain that are very key for Quarkus so for example the uh, HTTP layer and uh, JSON parsing we replace that with, with Quarkus variations that are very well integrated they're super fast you know fine tuned etc then because we do we replace the key parts that are like already there in Quarkus. Everything works out of the box. So let's say you have uh, micro profile annotations for retries, for um, failover, fault mm -hmm. Cool. All all that works out of the box for free. And I was I was watching the other day a presentation like in uh, you know Python, and the guy was doing like okay. So because the model can uh, be slow, I'll do a loop of one, two, three to call three times. You know, Jesus Christ. You, you, know? you could even have a fallback, right? You can call ChatGPT if not available, go to cloud or to yes. a... You yeah. can, what's the business case would be, right? You start with the cheaper model, maybe which is not always available. And if th then you can fall back to a model which is always for, uh, available, but more expensive. So costs are also inter interesting. So this is everything well integrated. So so that works out of the box in Quarkus. You get it for free. It's like all the, the pricey features. And of course, everything you do compiles to native. Just yeah, this is what I wanted to tell you. I was I wanted to ask about this. Like you come from Quarkus and you didn't mention native compilation because if this is a proper Quarkus extension, it, it removes is. reflection, yes. right? So yes. it removes reflection. Yes. So everything is pre-compiled and prepared. So the startup is fast and whatever. Yeah. And it means we can completely natively compile this, which makes it, what you could do with it, the greatest prompt ever, right? You can have a Quarkus command line application with LangChain exactly. and have a facade to all your models. You can say, hey, uh, ChatGPT, how is doing? And then you can pipe it over <laughs> to Claude, the Claude answers, yeah. and mid-journey generates an image, right? So you can go crazy <laughs> with everything. Um, so, um, yeah. So, yeah, that's why I was saying, you know, the combination is great. It's just uh, much made the heaven, and I think it will make Quarkus even more interesting, you know, as a... You know, sometimes you look for a killer feature that really lifts like the project, and I think this one is one of them. Yeah, and uh, the uh, Langchain people are already excited. So what I saw in conferences, so they, they, they have Quarkus, and and <laughs> I think the killer feature is uh, is the dev mode in dev the, in the yes, dev console yes. that you can play with prompts. You know, there this is uh, this was actually really great because uh, you 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 just you know load it and then you can immediately play with it, right? Yeah, and I, w I was joking, and I put out a tweet saying that uh, 
Quarkus dev mode is the Jupyter notebook of Java. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. No kidding. Yeah. So I, you know, I think for the Java folks, this is a very interesting time to be. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really interesting to see like what they will come up with. Because as soon as you show this, ah, yeah, one more thing we have to say, right? To people, just you can see their eyes, you know, like shining. Oh, you know, I can do this, I can do that. The other thing we didn't say, of course, we forgot, the super important, is the tools functionality. So basically, you just go in, the, in your code, you put a tools annotation on everything that has, let's say, simple arguments, strings and stuff. Mm -hmm. And in your um, bin where you define the interface to talk to the LLM, you say, oh, you can also use tools from this other class. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is in the discussion, uh, Blanchain you know, will send metadata about this method and you make it part of the tools that the model can use. Mm -hmm. And then the, the model can say, oh, you know, this method looks interesting. So we'll reply back behind the scenes and say, call this method for me. We call this method, we take the result, we put it into the conversation, we call mm -hmm. back again with all the discussion. And then it might use it for things like, I don't know, I have an example where, you know, the model doesn't have time. So I have a method, you know, get current time. Yeah. And the model will, will call it, will figure out the right arguments, the return value. And so you can annotate pretty much anything, you know, get customer, change booking, blah, blah, blah. And, and what's crazy is like, you know, you, you've been here a long time. So let's say we had, you know, Corba, IDL, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You define an interface, you know, mm -hmm. the, the mechanical aspects on the interface, the methods, mm -hmm. the arguments, the types, all that. But the interesting thing was actually in the comments. Mm -hmm. In the comments, you said, mm -hmm. this method does X, Y, Z, and you mm -hmm. have to call it in that sequence and, and all mm -hmm. this stuff. So it's like suddenly the machine understands the comments. Yeah. Not even the comments. You, even if you provide nothing from the name of the method, they can figure out, oh, you know, I can use this to do that. Mm -hmm. For this me, is, this, this is, is magic. actually the, the most interesting and biggest feature, I would say. These uh, tools. And I'm surprised we didn't say, you know, we tell it at the end of the call. So. Yeah, you are you are not not a good manager, Corcus manager. I say the, all the <laughs> all the best features we we talking about HTTP calls. We are excited about scopes because tools is big, but yeah. I think it has to be supported by the model, right? Because the model, yes, 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 yes because it's not yeah. always model support Correct. that. Yeah, and. Um, what this is for me is almost like a plugin, right? So the model does something, and you suggest model functions or methods. Mm -hmm. Say, hey, model, if you if you don't know about time or location, call me. I know it. So yeah. and and the model calls you to decide. Yeah. And think about ruler engine, right? So mm -hmm. if the it would be allow what it could do in AI, create you know you have all the tool methods exposed, mm -hmm. and you can say model, hey, this is the decision points. Call this and this and this. Decide, right? Mm -hmm. explain the decision, this is, would be explainable, and call this method back. So we get a very simple rule engine, and we get the entire trail because we could also audit the method calls. So we would see in Quarkus which method was called by the model. So we get the transparency, you know. For, yeah. the, for this decision of the rule engine, this method with this results were called. The explanation of the model is this, and this is the result. And this should be actually good enough to estimate in, is it hallucination or not, right? So this is pretty good, I would say. Well, yeah, oh, sure. Um, let's see. <laughs> yeah, I'm really curious. But anyway, for me, when I saw this for the first time, I said, Jesus Christ, this is amazing. Like, yeah. this is amazing. Like, really. Uh, for me, that was really the most interesting feature of, of all. And, and you know, the, all the um, people which look at this and say it is negative, not deterministic. I say we have no choice because the AI is out there. Everyone is excited. Uh, marketing de department are already thinking about ideas and we will just get use cases. Look, we have to integrate AI with our application, period. It's not like, you know, whether I like it or not, I have to. Yeah, yeah. And now the question is how to do it properly. Yeah. And I would say what Java is really good, I think outstanding, if you look at the ecosystem, 
is to know packaging, dependency management, deployment, CI, CD, this entire thing. I mean, everyone copied yeah. Java in one point of time. And um, and it runs for years, actually, very stable. And uh, and now what you said, now we have with Quarkus, you know, we have the perfect integration between the old Java e microprofile, uh, not old, I mean, still fresh world, yeah. and AI. And this is seamless, right? Yeah. So you get all the... And all, all the procedures in place with config properties, you know, staging environments, everything is already set in place. There is nothing to do. We add another, you know, um, um, integration with uh, LangChain and it's working. By the way, I do the same with serverless. So mm-hmm. I have my own Quarkus. This was my talk, you know, this was the, the, the competition to your talk. Mm-hmm. So um, I had a Quarkus and I say, okay, it runs on bare metal, but with one extension, HTTP Lambda, I can actually move it to the cloud and I get exactly the same code runs in the cloud. Now, if I add LangChain, I could, if it's fast enough, of course, I mean, it has to answer in 30, millise- 30 seconds, okay. So now I can have serverless Quarkus, you know, running a serverless Lambda and talking to a serverless model. So, and and, and this is this is the interesting part, not that like, you no know, Java is a bad as a language, but I would say Java is really good for speed, performance, so it's cost savings, and the integration with enterprise apps, already existing apps, everything is Java, right? Of course. And just think about it, like the, the maintenance aspect. Yeah. Who's going to maintain like uh, Python applications that uh, on every update they break? Yeah. This, that's impossible. Like no serious person will do that. So, you know, it's okay to do like a throwaway thing. I want to quickly do something and throw it away. That's fine. But Java there is unbeatable. So I think in the long run, we will uh, win this race. Of course, Python will have its use cases and, and everything, but uh, Java also has a big role to play into this. So, um, yeah. yeah, excellent. Uh, so, so I need to see your talk now. It's published. Mine as well. It's yeah, published. I'm curious about your feedback. So, uh, uh, so the, uh, <laughs> what, what I did wrong because I coded a little bit and explained things, you know. So, of um, course, also in the same direction, like uh, serverless Java, same arguments, and um, yeah. And I will have to watch your talk. So this is now the, the deal, right? So yeah. we have to, to, to stop here, this is a cross-watch, our talks, the most exi- exciting hour ever of our lives, I would say, better than horror, you know? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. All right, excellent. Nice talk to Thank you. you. Where again, people uh, can find you? Quarkus, LangChain, or whatever? Well, I don't know. Yeah, just if you go to the Quarkus website, uh, my Twitter, ex-Twitter handle is Dandreadis. Mm-hmm. Are you on Blue Sky? No. Should I? <laughs> yeah, it's a nice community. Lots of Java developers. Yeah, I send you an invitation. Yeah, send me, please. Excellent. All right, nice talking to you again. Huh? Thank you.